Yeah. All right, Dr. Katha Walla talking to us about surviving the Serengeti. Because if you think about it, a lot of 
than are needed at home and to do other work and to make money. Um, and then just as an uh, additional point, they have a shortage of physicians. So in 2012, they had 0.3 physicians for every 10,000 uh, residents. Um, and now I'm going to talk about just like emergency medicine really quick in Tanzania. So emergency medicine is actually a new specialty as it is everywhere. It's very new in Tanzania. There's only one training program, um, and it's in it's Mohimbili University, and that's in Dar es Salaam. Um, and to up until 2016, there was about 26 total. EM trained physicians in the entire country. Um, even having emergency rooms and emergency departments is sort of a new concept there. Uh, they, uh, many places that I was reading, you know, they would have the normal departments and then they would have a casualty room. And that was kind of, I guess, what you would call the emergency department. Um, but now that they've started this program, it's really made a difference. Um, and I wanted to show you guys a video from one physician I graduated from that program. You didn't Being a doctor, we are able to change the course of life. But in Tanzania, it used to be more of a lot of people. Life expectancy was only 50 years old. We had no access to doctors. Emergency medicine did not exist. When I was young, people were dying of curable diseases. It wasn't right that women only became wives and mothers. I wanted to be different. The hero of my favorite book were female doctors. That inspired me to dream of life beyond the walls of my home. Even when people say that only men became doctors. Years later, I traveled to the restaurant. Healthcare in Tanzania was far behind the other parts of the world. Fortunately, I would find so it's not for the way they were, but for the way they could. There was a brand new emergency medicine program and they partnered with us for the long term. The knowledge you share can save someone's life. It's because of them that I was taught by the fathers of emergency medicine. Within two years, the in-hospital mortality rate broke by 40 percent. Life expectancy is 65 years at present. What we are building together is helping ensure the health of many future generations. I hope my story helps young people imagine the difference they can make in this country. We are changing Tanzania, one life at a time, and there are many more behind me.
So basically, I don't know if you guys caught it, but uh, towards the end, she started throwing out some statistics, and she said that um, after the opening of the emergency department and it being properly staffed, uh, the in-hospital mortal mortality rate went down by 40%. So I think for uh, almost all of us, almost all of us, uh, we didn't really know medicine before there was emergency medicine, and so we don't really know how our specialty changed things. But if you go to countries um, that are underdeveloped and that don't necessarily have a concept of emergency medicine or emergency care, you'll realize how much of a difference we can actually make. And that was what I wanted to get across with that video. Um, so now I'm going to talk about Molly and I's experience. We went with, a, with an organization called Projects Abroad. Um, and we did sort of an internship observership at a hospital in Arusha, Tanzania. And it was St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Um, so just in general, like, so I can point out things. So this was their, this was the hospital. So all the corridors and all the hallways, I think they're open to the year. Um, this was the outpatient department, which was basically like primary care. This building over here, the bottom floor was like OBGYN and surgery. And then the top floor was the medical ward. Um, I had other pictures, but then I lost the phone that I took there, so. Um, it, behind here somewhere, they had like a pediatric ward, which was just one floor, and then they had a separate center for um, HIV patients, where they sort of every month would refill their prescriptions for them. And then there is a small area back, like over here, um, it was basically the radiology suite, which was x ray, and uh, there was an ophthalmology department that had its own building, which was interesting. Um, but the top floor of the ophthalmology department uh, actually had private patient rooms for the VIP patients that could actually afford their own room. Um, and while we were there, we saw a lot of things. And there's a high burden of disease there that is uh, fairly different from what we might typically encounter over here. Uh, clearly, HIV AIDS is a is a much larger burden on the healthcare system in Tanzania than it is here. Um, and actually, when you go there, they don't really call it HIV and they don't call it AIDS because of the stigma, at least not in the hospital that we were at. They would say IDS, for immunodeficiency syndrome, so that people around did not know what we were talking about. Um, so AIDS or HIV affects about 1.5 million uh, in Tanzania, and of those, 68% of the adults are on antiretrovirals, and only 46% of the children are. Um, and then of pregnant women, about 84% are on antiretrovirals. Um, and then you see that, I mean, HIV and TB sort of go hand in hand. There's about 42% of patients who are being co-treated for, for both of them together. Um, also, there's a high incidence of like parasitic disease there, um, and also, which I obviously went there and I was expecting all these different things and then I forgot to realize that medicine is medicine all over the place. So cardiac issues are big there. We have a lot, there were a lot of patients with CHF, cardiogenic shock, um, and it was fairly prevalent. So the things that are common here are also common there. Um, and if you look at the top, and causes of death in Tanzania, uh, neonatal disorders is actually the top. And that's because like almost 90 something percent of births are done at home and probably there's not even a role for, I mean eventually there will be, but right now most of those deaths are probably occurring at home. Um, so I'm gonna go through a couple of patients. Now these are not the real patients for patient privacy. I did not put their, I never took their pictures and I didn't really put them up. But um, the way you see this kind of way out, that's basically what the hospital looked like over there. Um, there's no private rooms. There's like, you know, it's just beds next to each other. This actually looks a little bit nicer than, than the place that I was at. Um, but I'll give you some example, examples of patients. So just pretend that the people look like their age. Um, so, this man over here, 32-year-old male, this is a real case, 32-year-old male, he had recurrent hematemesis and 
red, red blood for rectum, and he was coming in with malaise and dizziness. He um, had an initial hemoglobin of 3.7, and he only got transfused one unit of blood. And the reason why is because they were waiting on family to come in to donate the second year. So that's like a big deal in Tanzania, they have a shortage of blood. And I was kind of like, what? And then it just kept happening and happening where there were more and more patients that were just waiting for family to come in and give some blood so that they could live. Um, another patient that we had, a 52-year-old female, she came in with anisarca, a dyspnea, a distension. They were treating her for CHF, but she like clearly had like renal failure. I don't remember what the creatinine was because I couldn't read it off the little receipt thing, but um, she was in, she was in renal failure. But this hospital, this is a standard district hospital, did not have a dialysis. Um, so she was actually set up for transfer to a different facility so that she could get further care. She was the first patient we saw on the first day, um, and then by my last day when we went in, she had passed away the night before uh, because she didn't get transferred in time. Uh, another patient, 32 year old female. She was IDS stage four, so she was AIDS status. Decreased consciousness and vomiting. Um, she was being treated for cryptococcal meningitis. Uh, just presumptively. So another interesting thing is that they don't do LPs on the, on the regular there. Um, they have a deficiency of LP kits, and they pretty much just diagnose clinically. Um, this patient, she was she was pretty severe mental status. When Molly and I first saw her, we were like, why, why is she not intubated already? Um, and she stayed not intubated for the rest of the time that we were there. But What's interesting about the patients in Tanzania is that you see a lot of resilience that I can't really explain. Like, I don't know that the patients, I don't know, it's very interesting. Like, I would have expected that patient to crash on the first day, and she did it. She sailed along for the next couple of weeks. I'm not sure exactly what happened with her course of care, but she was not transferred um, during my time. Um, uh, we had another patient, 23 year old male, nuanced headache, inability to walk, 23, inability to walk, inability to talk. Um, he obviously had some sort of encephalitis, meningitis. He was pending head CT because we didn't have it in our facility. Uh, when we saw him, he was too small, he was diaphoretic, he was febrile, and they had given him about 500 cc's, maybe. And it was like, you know, these things that we don't think about over here, but there they have to think about every fluid bag that they're going to run, they have to think about doing it. And then it's, it's kind of like a process. Um, and then we had a 65-year-old female. She basically came in with acute onset dyspnea. She was altered. She was a demodist. She was peripherally, peripherally cold. Um, she didn't have a palpable radial, but she did have a palpable femoral. Her blood pressure was like 80 over 40. Her heart rate was 65. She was basically in cardiogenic shock. Um, but they don't have pressors there. So they didn't have levo, they didn't have dopamine, they didn't have dopamine. Um, they did have uh, IV adrenaline or epinephrine. So, but they could only give that in pushes. They couldn't actually put it on a, a like a central line and give it to the patient. So that patient was, I believe, also set up for transfer. But it was just really interesting to see that these things that we order off the bat and we just, you know, finagle, they they don't have it. And they have to be transferred miles and miles away just to get that care. Um, so it goes without saying that clearly there was a lack of resources there. Um, there were two oxygen tanks for the entire medical ward, and I only named a couple of patients. There were about probably eight patients that were hypoxic, but there were only two oxygen tanks. They somehow got a third for one of for another patient, um, but that was pretty much it. What was the electricity situation like there? Like we actually did experience any electricity outages, which was interesting, but it didn't happen. Follow was there. Sure, they have a backup generator. Just curious. Um, 
clearly, I mean, bypass the you don't even think about it. They didn't have it. They had no intubation equipment. This is a standard district hospital. No intubation equipment, no vets. If somebody needs to be intubated, they need to be transferred. Um, no pressers, no central line, no hemodialysis. The laboratory capabilities were limited as well. Um, they basically could not run like blood cultures, I mean, not in their facility. They couldn't run blood cultures, urine cultures, CSF. If you were going to get it, it had to be. It had everything had to be shipped out to another laboratory. Um, just basics, like a basic CBC comp, they could run. Um, obviously, there were limited meds, as I said before. And what was really shocking to me and Molly, but now I realize that given all the limited resources, with no intubation equipment, etc., they didn't have any. The entire standard district hospital between the PEDS board and the surgical board and the internal medicine board, none of the, there was no baby. Um, and that was really interesting um, and sad. Um, so that was basically the medical part of this um, and the medical part of our mission and elective when we went there. And there was a lot that was that we learned. A lot of it was observership, but to be honest, you you learn a lot just by being there. And a lot of you may have traveled as med students, but when you go as a physician, as a medical professional, and you recognize what you would do in that situation and what resources would be at your disposal had you been in a different country, it really, really hits home. Um, it's not the same as being a med student and being like, oh, this is horrible. No, you, you realize how horrible it is and you can't order what you want to order, and you can't get what you want to get. Um, but we're going to move on from that. And I'm going to now talk about um, the Serengeti and sort of safari stuff, um, which was this, the one we were there for a couple weeks. We spent most of our time at the hospital. Um, and then we took uh, a week to go travel. And if the, this experience wasn't reason enough to go abroad, um, so before we start safari survival here, I'm sure Ben can give you <laughs> more tips on what else to bring. This is like the basics of the basics. Um, first aid kit, make sure that there's gauze and needles and like band-aids in it. Um, Cipro for like any uh, bacterial illnesses. Sunblock, make sure you wear sunblock. I like chose not to, but my skin is darker. Molly like basically turned into a lobster and she wore sunblock. Um, Benadryl, very important. Anti-diarrheal insect repellent. Um, it, a lot of the insects in the safari were the CC flies. CC, I can't say CC. Um, <laughs> um, which I'll talk about later. But they actually they say insect repellent doesn't really work that well. But just just do it anyway. Um, and then malarone, which is uh, anti-malarial. Oral rehydration cells, which I think we have to use. And then if you're really going for like a you know medical mission trip or you anticipate any injuries, you should probably bring sutures and maybe like a little suture kit. Um, so we'll start with a day in the Serengeti. So these are actual pictures. That was our this was the jeep that we were in. And then the top opens so you like stand on well, I have to stand on the seats and then look out. Um, and then this was, this is the real picture, this is where I'm for operator. And obviously we saw lots of animals. Uh, baboons, this was within the first literally like two seconds that we started. It was just like baboons everywhere. Um, well the beast, these are buffalo. They look like hippos but in the grass. Um, and then zebras. Um, so one of the so one of the things that can happen on safari, which currently has happened, um, is that you go near the hippos, uh, and like there was there was a it's not funny, but it's funny. Um, there was this case of uh, I don't know exactly where this was, but some poor guy took his clients um, on a boat in the river, and there were hippos there, and then one of the boats got overturned, and then they came 
came face to face with a hippo. And this is what he wrote about an experience. I was swallowed by a hippo. Now, I don't know if it was really true, but he says that he was like half swallowed and the bottom part of his body was out of out of the hippo's mouth. It, this is really reality, I don't know. But if that were to happen, um, the most common like injuries are really like crush or if you live, crush or amputation injuries. And interestingly, there is um, some information about this. So the hippo is actually considered like by a lot of people the most dangerous animal in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it is definitely responsible for more deaths than lions, but it's overall there's really not that many deaths uh, on the safari unless you do something stupid like couldn't your hippo. Um, but there is information uh, there was research done on this. There was only like two case reports. Uh, but this was one that was actually done near in, in Kenya, in a Kenya hospital. And what's interesting about it for all of us residents is that all of the care was delivered by the residents because the attending anesthesiologist had to like go, he was in on another trauma somewhere else, and the attending surgeon was not there. So actually, the surgeons were mentored via telemedicine. But it was a patient, basically hippo attack, had a almost partial amputation of the left femur. And uh, they obviously, so what, what do you do? So you basically, the most important thing is hemostasis, and then they have to cut down. Um, the patient ended up surviving, actually, uh, did get reinfected, and had multiple like washouts. And the situation of the dress again and again, and did in between get like septic and then became unseptic. But it was just interesting to see that because I was looking for some sort of uh, literature on this, and it was only two, there's only two like case reports, that's it. Um, but the most important thing if you get attacked by a hippo is hemostasis. Don't forget, obviously, don't forget your ABCs and C circulation if you're bleeding out the drink it on it. So um, one of the, so I just put this graphic up, but basically you tie the tourniquet and then put this stick, you should be able to find a stick in the spur. So put this stick in between the knot and then turn the stick until you don't feel distal pulses. Now obviously if the patient's like mangled or doesn't have a foot anymore, you're not, like, obviously you're not going to feel pulses. But um, that's, so that's the most important thing. So before you freak out, stop the bleeding, stop the bleeding. That is what so let's say you continue on your journey. Uh, this is a real picture. I took it. Um, and uh, you see some more animals. Most of these are my pictures, some of them. Uh, elephants, lion. The lion, he, he had actually just finished like eating like a zebra carcass when we saw him. So he was sleepy and happy. Uh, zebras, ostrich. If you guys have never seen an ostrich run, you should like Google it. It's quite an entertaining. Um, and so you're on your way, and like you start getting stung, right? You're like standing in the jeep, and your head is out the window or the top, and you start getting stung. Uh, yeah. So we're going to talk about African sleeping sickness, the the fly, this CC fly. Um, basically, it's known to carry or it's known to carry trypanosoma brucei broad or something. Um, which basically there's two forms. There's one in West Africa that's chronic, and then there's one in East Africa that's acute. It's pretty rare, so like you might get like stung a bajillion times and you, you, you won't actually get a disease. That's most likely what's gonna happen. Um, but basically it's a parasite, the vector is the trypanosoma is the parasite, the vector is the fly. And once it bites you, it, it injects the parasite into you. And then it disseminates via the lymphatic system, and then it can affect your CSI. Um, it's a pretty declining incidence, though, and typically it's in rural and remote areas, so probably underreported of that. When you treat it, or how do you know? Like, I got stung a lot of times, um, and I was like, how do I know that I'm not going to die tomorrow? Um, what will happen is that you, there'll be a painful, like you'll you'll get like a welt and a painful uh, tank, tank or, or um, at the site of the bite, and then you'll have myalgias, severe headache, um, and the treatment basically is a medication called 
experiment. Um, it's basically used for this and rubber blindness. Uh, those are the only two uh, treatments that I saw, or uses that I saw for this. Um, and this is what it looks like on a blood smear, which is real nasty. But it has like gel up. Um, okay. So that aside. So you're done with your day in the Serengeti. And this was actually like where we stayed at night um, in, in the middle of the Serengeti. Um, and it's like a tent, but it has like a, it's like a pretty nice on the inside actually from what I would have expected. Um, bathroom, like beds, and then this. Now there's like a line of tents and uh, at night what happens is like you have to be careful because we, we could hear like the you know, like cackling. Um, and so you're really not supposed to go outside at night without <coughs> guidance. And really, I guess you shouldn't need a reason to go outside at night, but I almost got bit by any, uh, you know, because I decided to venture out of the tent at 2 a.m. Um, and then subsequently got yelled at. But um, what do you do if a hyena bites you? The same thing as you would do before, ABCs first, okay? Hemostasis. Then, obviously they're all gonna get tetanus, like if you go to the hospital, hopefully they'll have tetanus and there'll be vaccine. Um, and delayed primary exposure and obviously antibiotics for this. Um, what's interesting is that I saw a case report on the spotted hyena, which is this guy. Um, and they like carry, a lot of them carry the rabies virus but are not symptomatic, which is interesting. Um, and it's very different from other mammals. Um, so that's just one little tidbit about having your legs. Um, and then you're basically done with the Serengeti. So this was actually at night, um, at night, like outside of our tent. And you decide to fly, and the flight was literally like a six person small plane that I thought was, I thought was going to die. Um, and you land in beautiful Zanzibar. So Zanzibar is on the coast, uh, it's like an island <laughs> east of mainland Tanzania, and it's absolutely gorgeous. This is actually what the, what the water looks like, except for, interestingly enough, when it's high, low tides, it goes, all, it literally goes like a mile and a half in. Um, so like, I wanted to go in the water and then I realized um, so the sites, I mean, we had we had some fun there, and then Zanzibar is known for its doors. Zanzibar is actually also I just I didn't want to put it in because I felt like it would get emotional. But Zanzibar was the uh, the eastern port for the slave trade. Um, so the Arabs, so the West was like they would go to America and stuff, but the Arabs. For the Arab countries, the slave port was Zanzibar. So if you go to Zanzibar, you'll actually see, like, you'll see where they kept the slaves, and then you'll see where they sold the slaves. And now at that site is a, is a church. They made a church there, which is very nice. But um, so there, there is a lot to see in Zanzibar. Um, and if you decide that you're going to go scuba diving, another thing that you should look out for is the stonefish, and that's like actually. Really um, the stonefish envenomation is actually supposed to be, from a lot of the things that I read, it's supposed to be one of the most venomous fish in the world. And then I read something else that said that's a lot. But I, I think it's pretty venomous. Um, what you'll get is like intense, immediate pain and swelling at the site. Very few people actually get like the systemic neurologic symptoms, um, myalgias and stuff like that. If you do start getting systemic symptoms, then you have to get the antivenom, which is
and don't have gauze, and you're sitting here complaining about valid or not, you're complaining about a lot of things, and there are a lot of countries in the world where patients would die for this gift. So let's keep that in mind. Um, and be aware of hyenas, hippos, and venomous fish. <coughs> Thank you.